This video is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to glorify drug use or any illegal activities. Hi everyone, welcome to this show. Today we have Dr. Rick Strassman. He's uh, author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and he has some books coming out uh, soon, later this year. I wanted to just ask you to just briefly give an intro about yourself and, um, and uh, your work. Well, um, I think the thing I'm most well known for is um, you know, getting the uh, American renewal of clinical research with psychedelics off the ground uh, in the early 1990s with our DMT work, um, psilocybin work as well at the University of New Mexico. Um, yeah, you know, so it was the first new study in a generation in this country. Uh, Kind of you know, set the stage you know, for all the uh, you know, subsequent work that has um, you know followed on its heels. Um, yeah, you know, so uh, I ran that study from ninety to ninety five, then um, kind of wrapped things up. Then did uh, you know clinical psychiatry for the next thirteen years, mostly in mental health clinics, uh, but some private practice. Um, and since uh, in 2008, I've been writing full-time consulting, et cetera, mentoring students. Um, the DMT book came out in 2001, um, and I've written a number of books uh, you know, since then. So can you just go over how you got, um, what the environment was like uh, during the studies? I mean, uh, from, from what I understand, the United States has kind of been hostile towards psychedelics. It hasn't always been like this. So can you just kind of give us uh, just a feel for how it was back then? Yeah, it was kind of the dark ages when it came to human research with these drugs. Um, you know, people were interested in mescaline you know, way back in the day and in, in uh, you know, the early 1900s, 1920, 1930. Uh, but mescaline never really took off. Um, then LSD was discovered in the mid 19, uh, the, you know, the mid 1940s, and uh, you, you know, became extremely popular uh, in both you know clinical work and in you know the world of research. Um, I think you know that was for a couple of reasons. You know, one was that its discovery you know, coincided with the discovery of serotonin. Um, in the brain as the first neurotransmitter, and be, and um, you know because of you know the similarities between LSD and serotonin, it started people thinking about you know psychopharmacology. Um, you know uh, what are you know drugs um, you know doing to the mind, uh, which up until then was still kind of a black box. Um, it was also around the same time as the discovery of Thorazine as an antipsychotic agent. You know, so the three, the um, the three legs, I guess, of modern you know, psychopharmacology uh, were established in you know the late 1940s or so: serotonin, LSD, and Thorazine. Um, you know, so there was an explosion um, of research uh, with especially LSD uh, for psychotherapy, um, understanding schizophrenia, um, exploring consciousness in general. Uh, you know, so they were kind of the wonder drugs for a number of years, at least, you know, 20 years or so. You know, but then, you know, because of their widespread abuse and you know, the you know, public health uh, you know, problems, which were which were an attendant you know, to the widespread uncontrolled use. And uh, because of their association with a lot of the social unrest at the time in the 1960s, early 1970s, um, they were scheduled, uh, you know, placed into Schedule 1, uh, the most restrictive legal category. And, uh, you know, clinical research, you know, basically, you know, stopped. There were no new studies um, that were initiated after, you know, the, uh, you know, the passage of the Controlled Substance Act. You know, so that was, you know, kind of the abyss, you know, that I was staring into um, when I started working on getting my permits and approvals and, you know, funding. Um, 
in uh, 1988. Uh, it was a two-year project, uh, you know, getting you know things off the ground with the FDA and the DEA. Um, I got a couple um, of grants, you know, to run the study even before I, you know, had the drug in hand. You know, let alone uh, you know, before I started giving it. Um, it you know wasn't a a case of antagonism, uh, you know, from the government at least like almost twenty years after the you know, passage of the Controlled Substances Act. It was you know, more I think um, a case of you know, bu uh, you know bureaucratic inertia. Uh, you know, people really didn't know you know how to you know deal you know with a straightforward you know psychopharmacology. Uh, you know, study in humans, uh, you know, with you know, psychedelic drugs. Um, the strategy I took was quite straightforward. Um, study normal volunteers, measure as many biological and you know, psychological variables as you could, and, you know, publish. Um, you know, so uh, I, you know, wasn't, you know, looking at, you know, psychotherapeutic use. I wasn't looking at spiritual use. I was, you know, just, you know, looking at, you know, characterizing the effects. Um, you know, like, you know, could you, like, you know, once again, you know, could you give, um, you know, psychedelics, you know, to people safely and, uh, you know, generate useful data? You know, so um, you know, before that, I had, you know, cut my teeth on melatonin research. Um, I had an NIH, you know, grant, you know, to study, you know, the pineal hormone melatonin. You know, so I had written a, a, a grant, had gotten funded, I had you know, published papers. Um, you know, so I was already like an established, you know, junior researcher as it was, or as it were, um, and, uh, you know, had some you know, legitimacy as a, you know, clinical scientist. But, you know, um, but all that being said, uh, it you know, took, you know, quite a while to work out a system with all of the you know, levels um, of government that were necessary, you know, to get things off the ground. So you brought up melatonin, and, and I believe that they have a common uh, backbone or however you want to describe it as far as their um, structure is concerned. And these chemicals, like, they, they have uh, vastly different effects. I take melatonin every night, and it helps me go to sleep, but DMT is completely different. So uh, when the government has a, a drug on in Schedule 1, uh, really the, the, the um, scientific research just stops. Is that is that how that works? Like if it's Schedule 1, they're saying there's no use for it anywhere? Uh, well, the three major criteria are no accepted medical use, uh, you know, cannot be given safely even under medical supervision and uh, and you know, highly abusable um, you know so you know it was a bit strange because you know these uh, you know drugs you know were given safely in medical settings uh, and aren't especially well you know they're not addictive you know they can be abused but a lot of things can be abused um, I think it was just kind of a slapdash attempt to restrict, you know, to restrict access, um, you know, to the public at the very least, you know, but also, you know, researchers were, um, you know, getting religion, they were getting, you know, revolutionary and, uh, you, know, the, you know, the feeling was that you really couldn't even trust, you know, the scientists with these drugs. You know, the most you know, striking example, you know, being Tim Leary. Yeah, but I, I think, you know, it was also the case with, uh, you know, some of the research was which was taking place in Baltimore at the time. I was playing around with ChatGPT and just kind of giving it different scaffolds to play off of with with um, pharmacology and just seeing what it could come up with, and it, it kind of comes up with a a bunch of different um, hypothetical synthesis you can synthesize. And um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on artificial intelligence with um, pharmacology or psychedelic um, synthesis or anything from that nature. Yeah. Um, well, you know, maybe I can make a quick you know, comment about melatonin. Um, you know, one of the major impetuses uh, for my 
you know, doing research, I mean, in the you know, first place um, was to understand the biological um, you know, bases of spiritual experience. Um, and you know, back then there was not much known about melatonin. You know, this was, you know, the mid eighties or so. Uh, you, you know, there were some data, you know, suggesting that melatonin was psychedelic. Uh, it made depression worse. It stimulated dreams, might make you psychotic, all kinds of things. Um, you know, there was really no exhaustive understanding of the psychopharmacology of melatonin. And, you know, because of the association of the pineal gland over the millennia with spiritual states, I thought, you know, maybe you know, melatonin you know, could be psychedelic, like a, a, a spirit molecule. Um, in other words, if, you know, levels of melatonin increased in whatever set of circumstances, it might bring about you know, highly altered states, um, like, like dreams, even schizophrenia, you know, but, uh, you know, all we found with respect to the psychological effects of melatonin was that it was sedating, you know, so by then I'd learned about DMT, which as you note is, um, it's also a tryptamine, uh, you know, with an indole, uh, you know, backbone, um, you, you know, but it's a bit, you know, tweaked, uh, and, you know, that tweaking, you know, results in, uh, it you know, being you know, profoundly psychedelic, it's also uh, you know, produced naturally in the human body, you know. So you know, I I then you know switched my focus to DMT. Um, I don't really know much about AI design of new drugs, you know, but it is a thing. Um, you know, there's a few companies out there which are um, you know staking their you know, claims on the development of new psychedelics, you know, based on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, you, you know, obviously, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, you first, um, you know, need to synthesize the drug, you know, then you put it into animals, you know, see if it you know, makes animals behave as if, you know, they are on a well-known psychedelic, uh, you know, drug like LSD or psilocybin. Um, and, you know, then just, and, you know, then determine its uh, you know, safety uh, in lower animals and, you know, then, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, carefully, um, you know, start giving it to humans. I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest, if any of those newly designed AI generated, you know, psychedelics have been put into humans yet. You know, maybe animals, although I must admit I'm, you know, not as you know, current as I you know, could be in the field. I was thinking more from a stance of medicine. I mean, um, a lot of people are probably wondering, you know, what can psychedelic research really um, teach us or, or give to us? And, um, you know, there could possibly be a bunch of different medicines that we're not exploring because we don't have the licenses to explore because the government won't let us explore. It is kind of where I was um, jumping into. Yeah, well, I think in the case of new psychedelics, anyway, it's um, you know, kind of like whack-a-mole, you know, with the DEA. Uh, you know, if it's like a Schedule One, uh, you know, compound, a new compound is automatically considered Schedule One. Um, it's called the Analog Substance Act. It was passed in '85 or '88. I'm not sure. You know, so if you develop a compound, you know, like MDMA or, or, you know, like LSD, um, and it just seems to have the same pharmacology, you know, the, you know, the same, you know, psychological effects, you know, then ipso facto, it's automatically a schedule one, you know, compound, uh, you, you know, so you can study schedule one drugs in humans, but man, it's really climbing uphill, uh, you know, so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, pushback. Um, you know, from, you know, the clinical research community against the DEA that automatically is, you know, putting these, you know, novel substances into Schedule 1. A lot of people in tech are like, they always promote the idea of, of uh, microdosing. And I'm just kind of curious from your standpoint, if that would have any effect Would that, would the science back anything like that up? Or would that be something that's kind of like a myth? Uh, well, we just don't have a lot of data on microdosing. Um, and I think also, I, I guess, you know, taking one step you know, back, um, you need to define microdosing. Um, I think you could uh, 
you know, kind of you know, differentiate three you know, different levels of microdosing. You know, one might be called you know, tiny microdosing, in which case you don't you know, feel anything at all subjectively, acutely. Uh, you, um, you take it and you just don't feel anything. You know, the other would be, I guess, a small dose, a, a small microdose, you know, where you feel like you've had a cup of coffee, like, you know, uh, you know, grossly speaking, uh, like a bit stimulated. Um, and uh, the other or, you know, the final or, you know, the highest level would be, I guess, you know, medium microdosing, you know, where you feel it's you know more than just a little bit of stimulation. You might even want to call it, you know, sub psychedelic. Uh, where you, you know, have you know the feeling that, you know that if you took a little more, it would become psychedelic. You know, so that you know, needs to be you know, differentiated when discussing uh, you know microdosing. Um, like I was just you know reading a manuscript by Jim Fadiman. It's like this compendium of all of you know the data they've collected over the last fifteen years or so on you know, microdosing, and. Uh, it's an astonishing compendium. Uh, everything gets better on microdosing. Your your parenting, your breastfeeding, your your coding, your acne, your zoster, your cognition, your sleep, your ADHD is just astonishing. Uh, you know, but the vast majority of those of, of you know those data are anecdotal. Uh, you know, there's no control, you know, substance or placebo control. Uh, there are, you know, self-reports, usually from, you know, survey studies, which are obviously, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, survey bias, as it were. You, you're only going to, you know, volunteer if you've had an effect, a, a response, um, both good and bad. But, uh, you know, the bad effects of microdosing are, uh, you're probably vastly underreported at this point. Um, you know, there's a small number of you know laboratory studies of microdosing. Uh, University of Chicago's uh, you're, you're probably doing the best work right now, um, and and even then, uh, you, you know, they've been doing EEGs and brain imaging and uh, you know neuroendocrine kinds of results like oxytocin and things like that. Um, you know, psychological testing and you know whatnot. Uh, you know, even those you know studies aren't really um, extending out very far. They might be a week or two or three. You know, so if you look at Jim's book, you know, Jim Fadiman's book, I mean, you know, there's enough information there and enough anecdotal information, which which would keep you know hundreds of researchers you know busy for you know decades to really. Uh, you know, flesh out, you know, whether or not, you know, microdosing is a real thing. Um, you know, the reports are real. Uh, you know, people feel better. They parent better or they feel, you know, better about their parenting. You know, they code better. You know, they feel more creative. Um, and, uh, you know, is it the drug or is it placebo or is, you know, the drug a placebo? You know, like, you know, placebos are a real thing. Uh, there's endocrine effects of placebo. There's endorphins. There's, in, in, you know, the, the, you know, there's alteration in your immunological system, inflammatory things, your brain wave, uh, you know, PET scans. You know, all those things, you know, change if you respond, you know, to an inert placebo. If you're given, you know, like a sugar pill, um, and you respond, you know, to it in case of, let's say, depression or pain. Or anxiety, you know, there are you know brain wave changes. There's immune uh, you know function changes and all those kinds of things. You know, so the placebo response is a biological objective response. You know, so it you know, could be that these small that these you know small doses um, of psychedelics are you know, behind the scenes without a lot of acute subjective effects, amplifying the normal you know, placebo response. Which you know may occur from um, you know neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, which may not require, at least in animals, a subjective effect. Um, you can give like you know very small behaviorally inactive doses of you know, psychedelics to animals, 
uh, and they still you know, demonstrate enhanced neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. You know, so if you know the same thing is occurring in in humans, you give a, a you know, sub psychedelic or even you know, sub psychoactive dose of a psychedelic, you, there still you know may be enhanced neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, which you know, then may supercharge the placebo response, and you know, people are smarter and happier and less depressed. So I just want to bring up the neuro plasticity and neurogenesis one is to uh, is to repair your brain I, I would assume and the other one is to break out of like old habits you can't if you learn something that's repetitive that's in your brain forever and then yet it's harder to to break out of that old habit is is that correct well you know, biologically neurogenesis means the production of new neurons from stem cells um and and uh, neuroplasticity is the increase in the number and complexity of the connections among neurons. Uh, you know, so what the behavioral or you know, psychological you know, correlates um, of that, you know, could be, you know, that uh, you're more open to influence, which could be psychotherapeutic, for example, or it you know, could be like crazy ideas as well. Um, you, you know, so... What you know, seems to be the case with, <clears throat> you know, with uh, MDMA, you know, classical psychedelics, you know, ketamine is, you know, that even a you know, single exposure you know, to those drugs in lower animals will stimulate neuroplasticity uh, for a week or two. Um, and, you know, that may correspond, you know, to what's called a, a you know, critical period in the human which would um, make you know, someone you know more amenable to um, outside you know, psychological influences. Uh, you, you know, so you know theoretically, you take a dose of psilocybin. You're in a critical period for a week or two. You know, that's when you really want to do your work, you know, psychotherapeutic or spiritual, you know, creativity, you know, those kinds of activities. And DMT is really interesting because it's the only one that's in our body by itself, right? It's not just in our brains, it's in every tissue, is that right? Um, it's you produced in the brain. Uh, it used to be believed it was made in the lungs, you know, but more you know, recent data indicate, you know, that it's made in the brain, um, at least in mammals. Um, and concentrations are quite high. Uh, they're comparable to you know, uh, you know, to neurotransmitters, you know, like serotonin and like dopamine, you know, so that's, you know, kind of, you know, raises the question of, is there a DMT neurotransmitter system out there? You know, just like there's a, you know, serotonin, uh, you know, neurotransmitter system. DMT, the spirit molecule, you had a, a couple of chapters about uh, the pineal gland uh, being point to in, in religions as well as uh, philosophies. Could you just kind of touch on that? Yeah, I, I you know, began becoming interested in the pineal gland. Actually, it was also, you know, due to Jim, uh, you know, Jim Fadiman's influence. Um, I was a, a student at Stanford in the early 1970s, and, you know, Jim had just completed um, his uh, you know, PhD in you know giving psychedelics you know to scientists to determine if it would enhance their creativity you know so uh, you know um you know, back then he was you know working in the engineering department at stanford you know helping engineers be more creative um and uh you know i was you know looking for or you know, thinking about some common biological denominator behind both you know psychedelic effects and the um, effects of Eastern religious meditation. Um, and uh, you know, Jim and I met and he said, well, you know, look into the pineal gland. Um, it has a long uh, history of uh, you know, being a spiritual kind of organ. Uh, it's, you know, located, you know, just under the anterior fontanelle. Um, it's, you know, the you know, subjective location of the highest, uh, you know, spiritual experiences in prayer, you know, meditation. Um, it's, you know, the uppermost, you know, level of, you know, things in the Hindu chakra system and the, you know, Kabbalistic, you know, Sephirot system. You know, so um, I began being interested in the pineal um, and um, 
was uh, you know thinking even you know way back then you know that perhaps the pineal gland it produced a you know, psychedelic substance uh, which would increase you know, during meditation or even in response you know to psychedelic drugs you know so as you know time went on um, it you know seemed as if the pineal could make DMT um, it you know contains all of the precursors or you know, the ingredients. Um, it you know, contains the enzymes which would convert the ingredients or the precursors you know, to DMT. You know, so um, I uh, you know, speculated, you know, in the DMT book, you know, that perhaps under extraordinary conditions, you know, that the pineal produced uh, you know, DMT. Uh, yeah, so that work, um, you know, uh, you know, drew the uh, you know drew the uh, drew the attention uh, of a pineal melatonin researcher in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Jimo Borjigan, um, who, you know, one of um, her graduate students, uh, John Dean, you know, the two of them, you know, started looking for, uh, um, you know, for DMT in the pineal gland. Uh, they published a paper in 2013, um, you know, uh, you know, documenting measurable levels of DMT in the fluid surrounding the pineal gland in the rodent. Um, you know, so that you know, seemed to confirm you know, that hypothesis. You know, they went back, though, a few years you know, later um, in a 2019 paper, which uh, you know, more definitively established that, uh, that, you know, that DMT is made in the brain. You know, they also you know looked again at the pineal gland, and even though the enzymes were there, the precursors were there, they couldn't find any DMT, and they concluded that that first study, which um, you know showed measurable levels of DMT, uh, was the result of the probe going in and out of the brain and you know, capturing you know, brain tissue, uh, as opposed you know to pineal tissue. You know, so the pineal may or may not make. Uh, you know, measurable levels of DMT. You know, you, you know, people w without pineal glands, uh, you, uh, you know, seem to live relatively normal lives. They sleep well, they dream, um, you know, no problems really. Uh, you, you, um, even though I'm, you know, not as, you know, as you know, current on the, or in the field as I was back then, uh, you know, the main you know, thing which occurred if, you know, somebody you had no pineal gland, you know, let's say from a tumor or a stroke, is they had more, you know, difficulty um, adjusting, uh, um, you know, to international travel. You know, jet lag was more of a problem, which, you know, was, you know, most likely the result of a lack of melatonin, you know, rather than a lack of DMT. You know, but uh, it's, you know, much more interesting you know, to me anyway, uh, uh, that the brain makes, uh, you know, DMT. You know, the, you know, the pineal gland story would have been, you know, the cherry on the, on, uh, you know, the Sunday. Uh, like it would have been a, a, you know, nice tidy picture and, you know, confirm, you know, the role of the pineal gland in spiritual experience. You know, but, uh, you know, the brain makes, you know, quite high levels um, of DMT you know, the increase in the visual cortex in the dying brain, which, you know, lends credence, you know, to the notion that elevated, uh, uh, you know, DMT is mediating at least the visual phenomena uh, of the near-death uh, state, you know. So, um, you know, the story is, you know, not yet, you know, finished with respect to the pineal, you know, but it's, you know, just beginning, I think, with the rest of the brain. So if somebody is reaching an altered state of consciousness through through meditation or sensory deprivation, um, is it safe to assume that, that DMT would be the, the cause of that, a, a, an elevated DMT? Well, uh, to the extent that non-drug states resemble those brought on by giving DMT, then it makes uh, you know, sense you know, that naturally occurring DMT is involved, um, you know, but it's really hard, you know, to measure, you know, levels of, of you know, DMT in the body. 
um, urinary levels, you know, blood levels, even spinal fluid levels, you know, they're very low, like, you know, uh, you know billionths of a gram you know, per milliliter. Um, you really need to use, you know, more, you know, high tech, you know, technology. Um, and, you know, John Dean, who was working with, you know, GMO in Michigan back then is, uh, you know, now at UC San Diego and he's painstakingly working on being able, you know, to, uh, you know, to measure uh, the you know, synthesis of DMT in the living human using spectroscopic you know, techniques. It's, it's, it's incredibly, uh, you know, technology int intensive, expensive, you know, very, you know, subtle, uh, you know, you know, signals, uh, you know, the equipment is quite, uh, you know, costly and the cost of scans is astronomical, you, you know, but still, um, you know, that's the holy grail is, you know, to be able, you know, to measure, you know, the synthesis of DMT in non-drug altered states, like in, in dreams, you know, meditation, breath work, psychosis, um, all kinds of altered states. So I, I know there's a lot of talk about uh, a metaverse trying to recreate the the, um, the simulation of a psychedelic experience would mimic a DMT type of um, state of being, or is this something that would only be through the through DMT? Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, I suppose if you you know recreated the visuals, um, you know, you might approach a certain you know, certain aspects of, you know, the DMT effect. But you know, keep in mind, if you smoke DMT or you're given it, you know, some other way, you know, those, uh, you know, visuals, um, even though the, you know, the general, uh, you know, form, you know, might be you know, similar between people, you, you know, the unique you know, characteristics or, you know, the unique features of you know the visuals would be dependent on that individual person um you know like are they happy are they sad are they jewish are they hindu are they buddhist are they christian um are they in good health bad health what's on their mind you know how are their relationships you know those you know those would all you know factor into the nature of the visuals uh, you know let alone or you know to say nothing of you know the emotional components you know the cognitive components as well you know, so, you know, I suppose they would perhaps start to resemble what might happen when you take DMT, but, uh, you know, they would be, I guess, at you know, this point anyway, a uh, you know, facsimile uh, on at best. So I've noticed that since marijuana is legal in a, a lot of different states, I've noticed that there's almost like this reckless type of attitude towards it. Like it's a cure for everything. And it's kind of like this new snake oil that people are selling. Um, are you concerned about uh, if that same type of thing happening to psychedelics if legalization were to happen? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you know, the folks out there, academic research, pharma, you know, cultural media, you, you know, the ones who are, you know, foisting you know, psychedelics as a panacea, um, uh, I think, you know, that's irresponsible uh, because, you know, they're helpful, but the, you know, set and, you know, the setting, you know, need to be just right. Uh, you need to be prepared, supervised, screened, worked on integration afterwards. Um, and you need to pay attention, you know, to adverse effects. Um, you know, over the last few years, adverse effects are getting more attention, uh, which is, you know, which is a good thing. You know, but up until recently, and even within academic research, you know, pharma research, uh, adverse effects are just kind of brushed aside they're swept under the rug uh and you know i think even in you know very well controlled you know clinical you know, research environment you're going to see five percent ten percent of people having problems 
which extend you know, beyond the actual administration of the drug. Anxiety, you know, dissociation, you know, derealization, you know, depression, uh, perceptual disturbances, all those kinds of things. You know, they may not be you know, super serious and require treatment, but they still can be troubling. Um, and I think it's only the last you know, few years that uh, the uh, you know the adverse effects are are you know, being addressed. Um, well, you know, the first you know paper that I wrote on you know, psychedelics was adverse effects of psychedelics. It was it you know, came out in you know 1984, and uh, like I was you know thinking back then. Well, if I'm ever going to give you know, psychedelics, the first objection will be. They're unsafe. You can't give them, uh, you know, to people safely. Uh, you, you know, so I scoured the literature and I, you know, read every paper that had ever been written on adverse effects of psychedelics, um, and there were quite a few, e even in you know 1984. Um, you know, so yeah, um, I don't think we're anywhere, you know, near you know categorizing or you know cataloging uh, the extent and the prevalence and you know the nature of adverse effects. Um, you know, so if, you know, they're touted as I'm depressed, I'm going to take a psychedelic and I'll get better. I've got PTSD and I'll take a psychedelic and I'll get better. Um, you know, that's just not going to work out. Um, you know, because if you're, you know, if you're not in a good you know, setting, like if you're not being you know, carefully monitored and prepared and whatnot, you know, th things can go, uh, you know, south. Like, you know, for example, you know, that Alaska Airlines pilot, a couple like a year or two ago was depressed you know read you know somebody's book about you know, psilocybin you know, curing your depression you know so like i think he was at the beach and he you know took you know, psilocybin with his friends and uh, he really didn't come down and he was on a flight and he walked up you know to the pilots you know uh you know to the cockpit and he you know, like as a pilot you, you know uh you, you know they let him in you know, um, but he was still in some nightmarish state, and he thought, you know, the only way he would wake up from that nightmare was crashing the plane. Uh, so, I mean, that was pretty scary you know, for everybody. You, you know, so, you, you know, that's an extreme example. You know, but I, I think, you know, that the media, if we're not you know, careful, is just going to have a heyday with adverse effects once they start accumulating and they get more and more dramatic. You know, you know, that's what happened in the first wave of research. Um, you know, people were jumping off of buildings, like even like, you know, one of my high school classmates, like a guy I ran track with, um, like after um, he graduated, he was in a hotel in Las Vegas, up on the top floor on LSD. He figured he could fly, jumped off and splat, you know, so, you know, those you know, kinds of, of, of stories are uh, uh, you know, going to get, you know, more and more attention if we're not, you know, proactive in, uh, y you know, describing that, yeah, five to 10% of people at least are, uh, are, you know, going to meet up with, you know, some adverse consequences. And we, you know, we need to be prepared. We need to, uh, you know, kind of explain them in a way that, you know, doesn't freak people out and, you know, derail, you know, the research. You know, so, you know, when when you people ask me uh, my opinion about legalization, increased access, uh, you know, my you know, feeling is uh, we need more research, you know, rather than increased access. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we could make these drugs, you know, um, m more accessible, you know, but within a... a uh, you know, highly uh, you know structured setting. If you know, for example, you're depressed, and you want to get your you know depression under control, uh, and you're you know, severely depressed, you ought to you know be able you know, to go to a place you know which isn't a strictly academic you know research environment you know but one which has got all of you know, the safeguards in place that have been understood to be important you know you know from the the you know strictly academic you know research world um if you're interested in you know psychedelics you know for other reasons for creativity for spiritual evolution 
you know, you ought to you know, be able, to, uh, you, know, to, uh, you know, to take them um, as well, you know, but in a safe environment, uh, you know, qualified uh, you know, sitters, um, you know, you know, certified, you know, drug, um, you know, good screening, good supervision, you know, good follow up, you know, so I don't think they need to be as restricted as, you know, they are in schedule one, you know, maybe a, a new schedule, uh, you know, rather than like, you know, descheduling them would, would, you know, be a reasonable option, like schedule, you know, 1A or, you know, 2A, you know, where they're still restricted, but, you know, not as restricted as is currently the case. Yeah, I've um, took ketamine therapy at uh, ketamine therapy, and um, it was under doctor supervision, and basically it was just an IV treatment, and you, you went into, like, this brightly colored room, and they made sure you were comfortable, and, but it was all done through the doctor supervision. They even had, like, a nanny cam, like, watching you to make sure you didn't do anything stupid, so... Um, but I, I do think that like, like ketamine, I don't know anyone that's ever never came back from it. Well, while I was in high school, there was a kid that took, uh, uh, LSA what, morning glory seeds. And he was never the same after he started. You know, it took yeah. Years. Yeah. Well, you know, some people, you know, they do go off the deep end, uh, from, you know, taking you know, psychedelics, if they're not like in a good place, they have a family history or their own history of severe mental illness, or, you know, they just overdo it. Um, you know, you know, DMT in a way is unique in the abuse realm. Uh, you know, the, like maybe once a year, once every two years, I will get an email from you know, somebody or from their friends or their you know, family saying, um, you know, my friend, my relative smoked, you know, DMT like a million times in like a six months period and they're in prison now. And, uh, you, you know, find out what, you know, kind of, uh, you know, symptoms, you know, they developed and, uh, they become, you know, messianic. They've got the answer to the world's problems and you have to listen to them. And if you don't listen to them, they get pissed off, um, and, uh, they get in trouble. Uh, you know, that seems to be, uh, you, know, you know, somehow unique to smoking way too much DMT. Um, and, you know, because they think, you know, the problem is with the rest of the world rather than with them, they really don't want to be treated. You know, so, you know, so they won't take meds and they can, you know, they continue, you know, smoking DMT, they continue getting into trouble. Um, and, you know, they spend a lot of time in prison or in mental hospitals. It's it's interesting, but there's there's certain people that just shouldn't touch it. You know, there's like, and that's that's true for everything, right? Even pain medicine. There's certain people that shouldn't touch pain medicine, right? Right, right. And you know, I think what is you know, key is uh, um, is education, uh, especially for such complex you know drugs as uh, the psychedelics. Uh, you know, uh, you know. You know, be prepared. So you, like uh, I published a book a couple of years ago called the Psychedelic Handbook, and you know the largest you know, chapter in you know that book is uh, you know how to trip, or, you know how to get ready, you know how to prepare yourself. You know uh, you should dot all your eyes, cross all your t's. You know, have a you know, safety plan in place. Um, don't mix drugs. Make certain people uh, you know know what you're doing. You have recourse, you know, to support if you need it. Yeah, you know, tell your friends, you know, family that you're going to be doing this. You know, think about it if you're going to do it by yourself or with a friend outside, indoors, that, those kinds of things. You know, so I, I think um, when you're, you know, getting into such profoundly mind-altering you know, substances, you really need to, um, you know, prepare. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything that you wanted to to say, or um, uh, where can we find your books? What uh, can you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, a new book is coming out in December. It's called My Altered States. Uh, it's an illustrated memoir of my own altered states from zero to twenty-two, um, and it's available for you know, pre-order uh, on all your you know, favorite outlets. Um, and uh, you know, my website is rickstrassman.com and I answer pretty much every email, um, you know, so, f you know, feel free to write. You can order books, uh, you know, through my site as well. 
I'm all of my books um, are, um, <clears throat> um, are uh, you know both on my website and on Amazon you know, so you know, you know they're widely uh, available um what else might be worth mentioning yeah I th um, I th you know, think that's it you know contacting me and you're know, buying my books would you know, be the you know the two main points.